let's have some fun here. Um, let's go for something really extreme, okay? This isn't supposed to be kind of a depiction of a realistic area. It's just supposed to be, I don't know, kind of an example of a, I don't know, kind of, not abstract, but something kind of um, out of the ordinary in terms of just the, uh, the sheer volume of... Uh, you know, specific information that we're going to try and depict, and that's um, like a stack of waterfalls I kind of envisioned in my head. Um, I don't know, there's this sheer amount of um, kind of moving water in one given visual using all of the uh, um, waterfall stamps that I have, and uh, I've never used them like this before and wanted to see what we can do here just in terms of creating some kind of um, extreme type of uh, visual layout here. Okay, now, I had these kind of all lined up just a minute ago. Kind of in order of depth, okay? So these ones have um, some smaller trees on them, okay? So they would naturally depict something kind of farther off in the distance. I could do this one right here without the trees, and this could be, you know, four feet from us if we wanted to, but having those trees makes it kind of smaller. And that goes the same for all of these. I mean, we can take out these reference points um, in terms of the foliage like that if we want to, and make these whatever we want to just by not coloring it in and then making our impressions. But I don't know. I, I may use them and I may not. These ones right here don't have any of those types of reference points. So they could just be anything close up. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to make this... Um, kind of a stack of cascading types of falls in here. And I want to go really extreme with it, okay? Um, just, I don't know, I wanted to play around with, um, oh, some different pigment ink effects. Um, and, and just, I don't know, and see how it goes. I was thinking in mind, um, I was trying to think of some of these artists, classical artists, or I don't know if they're classical, but something like an M.C. Escher take on a, you know, a scenic waterfall type of thing where these things are not, you know, necessarily kind of going around in circles and kind of leading to nowhere, but, um, I don't know, just kind of playing around with uh, uh, the field, in other words. It, I don't know if I'll be doing kind of a flattening out of the, uh, of the surface here with this type of... Um, depiction of depth when this, within the scene. I'll still be using a little bit of a kind of foreground, midground, background, but not as extreme. I'm, I'm going to try to make more shallow the, uh, the, depth, uh, the depth of field in, in many ways. But we'll see how it goes. I don't know. We'll see how it, if it works or not. Okay. All right, so that was uh, Brook Falls right there. ink here. I need to really clean off my stamps a little bit better. It's kind of resisting some ink so I didn't get a perfect impression. I used um, some of uh, the uh, um, hybrid inks on this last time. I just found out that they're, uh, <laughs> I didn't even know they're oil based. Okay, so they're a little bit resistant, so, I mean, it's just simple. I just need to take this and scrub that off a little bit. I can use a little bit of a toothbrush and it'll come right off. Okay, so this is Babbling Brook, overlapping this one slightly, like about like so, okay. Same thing, I used this with the uh, hybrid inks last time, so some of these areas are a little bit blotchy. But with waterfalls, though, I'm not really worried about that at all, <laughs> because I'm going to be adding a lot of uh, pigment ink in there, so if there's kind of a diffusion of the imagery in the um, inherent in the um, impression itself, then so be it, because it's not going to be super defined anyway by the time I put the uh, white pigment ink over the top of it. Okay, so using a little bit more of this fall right here, I can stack this too, I can come up this way, but let's see what's going to fit. We have a lot of large images in here. And uh, let me see. Now, okay, now here's the choices that I'm having to make. 
I can put this right over the top of this and mask this off so this one merges right here. Or I can kind of create this other pool of water right in here and put this one right up here so it's like a cascading pool. And then this pool right here is feeding these waterfalls so it's like cascade after cascade. I think I like the look of this one. And I didn't, you know, I didn't you know, decide that until just right now. So that's an, another way you can compose things. You don't have to know exactly where everything is going to do. Now I happen to have wood mounted stamps here, so you know I have this indexing of that image right there and I could see it. But you know, if you have these kind of stamped out, you and you can kind of position around. Some people stamp these types of things on um, acetate or something like that with probably like a stays on ink or something of that sort. And uh, you know, they compose that way. They just put that, you know, transparency over the top of it. And that's a really good way to work. You can come up with some really um, elaborate compositions that way. Okay. That is the side falls large. And here's the cascading falls that were was drawn about the same time. So they have a you know, similar spirit. In terms of drawing styles, I've changed my drawing styles around a little bit over the years. I've added more textures. My early ones tend to be more kind of precision oriented. And the rocks were really quite smooth and whatnot. And sometimes I go back to it, so I kind of oscillate. Sometimes I'll go back to a much more precise, you know, type of um, stippling uh, rendering style rather than kind of the uh, Real rough one. I like to play around with uh, my drawing techniques and uh, rendering, drawing and rendering techniques. Okay, so always overlapping my previous impression a little bit. Okay, all right. Now I have this space open over here. I could use. One of these, see these rocks right here? So you're always using um, certain portions for what you want or what will benefit you. And I've drawn all of these designs with this in mind. So a design like this one right here would be, you know, this is one design right here, but then here's another design right here and another design right here. You know, this stack of them. Like I said, we can do it without these pine trees up here. So you don't have to have that extreme depth, and we can put another pine tree this size up here if we want to with a different design. And it makes this image right here much more shallow because you have the same size trees in the background. So there's different ways you can use these stamps right here. And my theory and concept when doing designs is you want to give the customer and the user, and remember, I'm using these things too, so I want a ton of uh, possibilities out of a single design, um, the way that I use it. So here you have those this rocks right here. Those are the same ones over there. Okay, so yeah, you want variety, and uh, with everything, you want kind of the possibilities to be wide open. Let's say I can go for another, like, mirrored. Um, waterfall right, right there, but I have to see if I have some space for it. Okay, now here's this large one right here. This one's the Gushing Falls. Maybe I'll, I can center this. This would be kind of interesting to have this kind of serpentining down like this, you know, a little bit. I can put, go waterfall here, here, here. So it's kind of going S-curve like that, you know, rather than stacking. You, I wouldn't want to go just stack, 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 stack. Unless I'm going for some sort of, you know, specific graphical statement, um, you know, in doing so to create a certain type of visual tension. If I did things that way, you know, if you make things really symmetrical, okay, it'll create a, a certain type of look. Oh, if you're doing something like that, but I'm not going for something like that here. Okay, I'm wiping off the bottom of this stamp a little bit. This will be where I add some uh, pigment ink. There's going to be a lot of uh, 
kind of mist rising uh, rising from uh, the churning water, you know, at the base of the waterfalls. Oh my gosh, this one's going to be so much fun with the bleed-proof white splatter painting, too. Anything, any excuse for using a lot of that is a good one. Okay, so it's right up here. Now, I'm going to be filling in between all these things, too, so we have a lot of work to do as far as that goes. And the most distance, distant um, tall rock falls small. I have a larger version of this, too. I should use that one. Huh. If I do that one, I can put this one over here, and I can put this one over here, making it look like it's going back in the distance like that. Okay, I need the larger one of this. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, let's see. Larger tall rock with falls over here. I think there was um, some little news blurb or something like that. Um, somewhere, I was on the uh, surfing the net. Which I haven't even heard that term in a while, surfing the net. Um, and it said something like, um, Niagara Falls undergoing repairs or something like that, you know, when they shut that water down. I didn't click on that link, but... Um, Maybe that got into my subconscious and I felt like doing something here uh, today. I looked look at it. I saw that um, headline yesterday. Okay. This one's a smaller one. Okay. Wipe it off down here. See this right here? Where I have that and that. I'm just going to mask off this portion. Okay. Have about a quarter inch showing, so when you snap this out, you don't get this big white, you know, space in between the two. Okay. Okay, we have that right there. I might leave that area open over there. Okay, now we have this space to each side of this um, cascading falls. I could put other things in there. Another part of this right here, in there. I usually just fill in with some additional rock forms, though. And this one kind of matches up a little bit more with this one. And I have to put some trees up here, but um, I'm just going to go for the ledge. Okay, and overlap into it. And in some of these places I'm overlapping a good. I wonder if I have room for another, um, let me see if it's something in here. Golly, do I do that? I hadn't thought about that, but that would be another waterfall right there. Hmm. This would certainly kind of lend itself to that extreme. Let's do that. <clears throat> this is a really big area fill in with just that ledge. So I think I'm going to go for this other waterfall right here. Just to <laughs> lend itself to this crazy um, spirit of a uh, falling water right near. That's what I'm going for. Let's just go, let's just keep doing this. We'll go for extremes here. It'd be good if this one I had a reverse image. You know, you know if you have this one and you want to go for a reverse, that'd be cool. <clears throat> that, uh, gosh, do I go for three of these? Let's go for three of these side falls. Why not? <clears throat> okay, let's really wipe off the bottom of this one. I want this one to kind of, uh, I want it to just kind of transition really smoothly um, 
in here, and I don't want this anchor point too strong, so that's why I've wiped off a really good portion off this bottom portion, and then I've taken off, I don't know, what is that, maybe an inch up into here? I'm not trying to go for a straight line. I have a lot of it taken off, and then as I'm going to move up here, I'm taking off less, so it's transitioning from dry to wet, and everything in between, you know, it's a range. Okay, and now, uh, let me see, in doing so, I, th I don't think I even need to mask. See, what I've done is I've softened my uh, transition points, which is the edge of this stamp, so it transitions into the previous impressions very nicely, very smoothly. If it stamps out lighter, you know, it's going to transition into the next stamp, possibly, you know, or most likely smoother, because you don't have these hard edges clashing against each other, okay? Okay, so... I've wiped off quite a bit, so look at that. Doesn't it look kind of more distant there, too? I think I'm going to leave this as is up here. I'm thinking about, um, maybe I'll put a cloud up here or something like that. That might be kind of interesting. It's kind of getting a little hazier as it moves off into the distance, even though this is a kind of a flattened space here. Um, okay, so I didn't use this like I thought I would. There's just not space in here anymore. There's just... All this crazy moving water. All right. Um, okay. I did ink that up, but I won't use that for an impression. Do I want this? Um, this is my Brookside boulders right here. I don't know. There's, this is really full. I think I will go for um, a cloud back in here. There's this kind of this cloudy haze back at this distance. The higher you go, usually um, in Western perspective, it represents more distant um, objects and spaces. Okay, so it's close right here, farther, farther, farthest, clouds and whatnot. And that transition right here where I've wiped off the bottom of these ones where it looks like it's, you know, going into mist or whatever. Um, if I put an extra cloud here, right here, um, I think it'll match well with that transition. Okay, so let me see. Let me grab my cloud. Okay, this is my cloud stamp. Um, the uh, presentation of this type of video comes, if this is like the first scene you've ever seen me do, uh, I hope the, uh, my instructional style here, at least in terms of this type of scene, it's not really so much instruction as, a, as me just turning on my camera as I compose a scene here. It's not like, this is how you do a waterfall scene type of a video, um, like a quick scene that I would be doing, or a... Stampscapes University type. This is me just kind of stamping and I'm just kind of experimenting and uh, I don't know, I'm trying to figure things out for myself along the way and uh, hoping you're enjoying it and coming along with the ride, so to speak. Okay, so I'm going to put this um, cloud, I'll put it in kind of in back of and in front of this um, tall rock with falls image. And I've really wiped off the perimeter of this cloud stamp. You know, maybe a good um, half inch to an inch into it. Okay, because I just want a kind of a real faint one like that. See that right there? So it'll be going kind of in front of it and in back, and I'll use these blue tones to kind of you know, bring all these scenes, uh, different, um, impressions together, okay? All right, so I have that cloud up here. One of the things I really enjoy doing is bringing kind of that spirit into my water. I get this churning water, and I like to bring in that same type of element throughout the piece. So, kind of at the base of the waterfalls, we have that. You know, it doesn't mean that, oh my gosh, there's sky in the water or something of that sort. It's just supposed to represent, 
you know, this billowing kind of mist, you know, that's coming up from the, uh, that churning water. And I'll incorporate this into the, uh, into the scene with the use of, you know, further use of the same, you know, color of blue that I used um, to stamp these out with. Okay, so I've really wiped off a lot of this. I just want to go for a couple light impressions of this here and there. Bring an element of uh, continuity to the piece. Okay, definitely looks crazy. I want to go for a crazy waterfall scene. The craziest waterfall scene I've ever done um, in my life. Okay, I need to clear out some space here. We're talking about a full page scene right here with a lot of stuff going on in it. Okay. All right, so the colors that I'm going to be using on here are blues and grays. We do want, I want a little bit of warm tone in here too. So as I've shown in some previous videos, I, using something like an antique linen, you know, uh, a light, warm um, tint is fun to add um, as a base coat um, to a lot of different scenes. It doesn't matter what um, temperature scene, scheme or color, temperature and color scheme you're going with. Um, it can serve its, its um, purpose very well in terms of kind of establishing this kind of warm base coat layer within your pieces. All right, now I'm going to use quite a bit of this. This is a really big scene, so I'm going to use a little bit of reinker on my pad. Sometimes you can just, if you don't even have a pad, you can just, I, I, I never stamp anything out in this color, okay? If I were to just, if I were starting from scratch with no inks at all, I probably wouldn't have even bought the pad. I'd probably buy the reinker. I mean, if you're collecting the entire range of, uh, you know, um, like a certain line of inks, then yeah, you, then you get it all. But um, there's a lot of different pads and inks and ink companies and lines of inks within each company. So uh, there's a lot to get. And I just, I buy it like anyone else. Um, except some recent hybrid inks where they, they sent those to me. But um, uh, I, you know... I just buy, you know, my reinkers um, for the colors that I'm not going to be stamping impressions out in. And you get a lot of ink in a reinker, and uh, you know, I don't need the pad for it. And I get a lot more, mo you know, bang for my buck using um, the reinker because there's a ton more reinker ink in a reinker bottle than there is the ink in of that same ink in the pad form, okay? But like I said, I mean if you get if you get both, like everyone out in Arizona, they you know, they tell me that um, there isn't like a pad they get where they don't get the reinker as well, you know, just because of the uh, arid um, um, environment they live in, so everything gets really dry. So they really, everyone buys reinkers, so they won't buy a pad that doesn't, you know, have reinkers available for it. But for me, um, I just have come to just get the reinker for a lot of different colors now. Okay, so I'm kind of modeling some of these areas a little bit. Okay, I'm largely going over them, but I'm leaving a lot of the waterfalls light. I, I, I like to leave my water running water lighter, at least in a daytime type of scene, than the surrounding area. So, okay, so that being said, so what I'm doing is on most of these rocks, I'm coloring them in. Okay, this is a very light color that we're using, but on some of them, I might leave, you know, the tops of them a little bit lighter. Like, see down here, if I just color everything in, um, you don't get any type of uh, contrast 
within your value scheme, okay? And there isn't any range in values um, in terms of light and darks. So if you oscillate your light and darks a little bit more um, throughout your pieces, um, it just makes the surface area much more rich because you have variety, okay? Monotony is could have a certain type of um, effect, you know, but by and large, you know, to make a more interesting looking piece, we want um, this oscillation of the different elements if it comes to color um, with value, light and dark, intensity, bright and dull, and temperature, warm and cool, okay? So when it comes to what we're doing right now, this is a warm tone here, but by and large, it's, it's kind of a base coat for adding tone into it. It's just slightly darker than the background. So what I'm doing is I'm establishing some lights and darks with it, okay? And you see how things are starting to just turn a little bit. Um, things are starting to stand out a little bit more that I want to stand out. But things aren't just colored uniformly, okay? And things start turning a little bit. They call this uh, this particular type of uh, um, color addition or tone addition. Um, it's like checkerboarding. Okay, you're oscillating things. You know, light and darks across the board. Okay. Now in this one, it's pretty extreme because I have all of that falling water. Okay. Now some of these I want some. I want to get some tone into it just so it's not so stark white everywhere but leave a lot of it just as is, okay? And see, by toning in the areas around my water, the water starts to stand out a little bit more. And the, you know, this scene's really about kind of that pathway of water, you know? And here it's just, you know, an, ex an extreme, you know, pathway. It's all over the place, but, um, Uh, but that's where our focus, uh, is, you know, is drawn to. And I'll refine all of this too. Okay, now I'm going with, this is gray. Um, there's a memento London fog out there. Any type of gray that you have, okay? If you have it. A lot of people don't have grays, you know, because they, they just like color. And that's fine, you know, you can go with a darker version of your antique linen if you have a, you know, walnut stain. I might use that walnut stain on here too. See what this is doing? This is just getting things a little bit darker here. Okay. Ooh, that's almost too much. Let me see if I can kind of blend that out a little bit. Okay, so... I might have re-inked this recently. I think I did. Boy, it's pretty dark. This gray usually isn't so dark, but maybe, yeah, maybe I re-inked this inker, or pad. Okay, so it's kind of making these uh, rocks seem a little bit more round in terms of the volumes, okay? See, this is where you really leave some areas a little bit lighter, so I'm not toning everything uniformly, and see, it, it gives dimension to those rocks in there. Okay, just a little right here, maybe I'll add a little bit more out here. So it seems like it's more in shadow than this spot over here, okay? There isn't specifics to, all right? It's not as if, oh my gosh, I inked up that rock instead of inking up that one right there. You know, it doesn't matter. What you do is you just, you just want a little bit of variety. So let's say on this one right here, see I'll put a little bit of tone right behind that rock right there. And this rock right here kind of stands out more, doesn't it? I mean, but that doesn't mean if I tone this one out, you know, it would push that one farther back. So it just, you know, it just, just don't treat everything uniformly. So don't see this, all these rocks here as like some sort of flat um, area. See it as kind of a, an area that um, has different depth to it and distance. And the only thing that you have to do is you just treat it a little bit different. You tone one thing in or area of it in a little bit darker than other areas, or don't tone it in at all. See this one right here? 
See how I just toned in the side of this rock and left the top of it lighter? And look how these ones really stand out by having this area darker behind it. And I can tone in the bottom of these ones if I want to. So you get a lot of depth there. This is what the thing that challenges a lot of people because they haven't worked with tonal designs before. They've only worked with outline designs, okay? And there's a different spirit to outline designs. Outline designs, you know, linear designs, ones that are, um, you know, they're about kind of shape only. They're not about volumes like a sphere. It's the difference between a sphere and a circle, okay? With a sphere, if you're coloring it in because it's three-dimensional, um, or representationally three-dimensional, okay? We're still we're working on a two-dimensional piece of paper here. But it represents three dimensions, so um, um, you're going to leave an area that's light on it, unlike a circle, which you might fill in the whole thing. All right, so just treating things a little bit differently here and there. It's starting to really take shape, though, isn't it? Um, in terms of the forms, they're looking a little bit more dimensional. What have we used right here? We've only used two colors so far. I'm, I'm bringing some of this gray into the water. I, it'll kind of provide a, you know, an element of continuity between the rocks and the water as well. Waters are um, starting to stand out a lot more in terms of contrast. Okay, one of the things, a little fine-tuning, i kind of already on it right here, is I like to add a little vignette around the whole composition. So I usually make my perimeters a little bit um, darker. I wouldn't do it around here if I want that water to stand out, but by and large, if there's rocks here, what I'll do is I'll just kind of slowly start taking my perimeters, and especially the four corners, a little bit darker. And that tends to contain the scene really nicely in terms of my composition. It's like a stage, you know, I'm not trying to create a depiction of a, you know, what um, a camera would be um, capturing on film. What I'm doing is, this is more like a stage here, where I'm staging a uh, scene for some sort of production or whatnot. And then what that does is it kind of gives a little bit of a, certainly self-containment, but it's like a, a world unto itself. It, it doesn't need anything else. And that's how stages are supposed to be, you know, for some set designer, you know. When you look up on that stage, that's its own world. It's not missing, you know, part of some other thing. You know, there's like a building on a stage or something like that apartment building and you know, there's a play, you're not supposed to think, oh, okay, let me see, well, where's the rest of that, you know? It's missing something, you know? Everything's all contained, self-contained. And you get kind of immersed in that world. 
All right. Okay, that was my gray there. I'm just using a paper towel here, of course. <laughs> I'm seeing if I can get make use of this other part of the paper towel. Okay, here's a um, salvia blue. Okay, just like that. And start bringing in this blue into the piece. Let's see if we can start bringing things together even more. Okay, I will go into um, some of my water, my falling water now, okay, with this color. I'm at, I brought in some of that um, antique linen. But uh, this is where I'll tend to... Okay, so it's important to not just tone everything out. A lot of times people think water is blue, so they just color in all that blue. But it's not, you know. It's You want this to be catching the light, so you want to put a little tint of it in there, but don't color it on the whole thing, otherwise it's not going to stand out anymore. It'll just be dark. Okay. Remember, kind of falling water, especially, is full of oxygen. Okay. So often it looks light. Okay. So we want that retention of light in there. But, you know, we want a tint of some of that color in there as well. So go ahead and add that in. But just don't leave, you know, um, just don't lose your lights. So if anyone ever has um, trouble, okay, with lighting, a lot of times people, you know, people can compose scenes no problem, you know, when I teach them. Um, and they, you know, it might not even be in a workshop situation, but it might have been at like a convention or something like that where they saw some demonstrations being done. And oftentimes the thing that um, people tell me um, later on is they say, eh, you know, I just don't get that lighting down just right, okay? And it's usually not with the first color or the second color. It's when they start moving into the third, fourth, fifth color, whatever. They start to tone out the areas that they've retained the light in, okay? So they've lost the range, okay? But let's say I tone too much in. I My water gets too dark. I'm not going to do it here, but... Um, what you do is you just, if you lose your lights, okay, like something like this, all you do is you just make the area around it darker, and then that will stand out lighter by contrast. Again, you might not have the white in there anymore, which is fine, you know, but just make other areas darker around something because, remember, this is all contrast that we're working with. There really is no light in the scene. It's only de the depiction of light, and you can depict light by putting something dark next to it, if that makes sense, okay? So, yeah, so when people just take things too dark, they get real comfortable with the coloring process. They're adding in color, okay, things are going fast, you know, whatever. They add things in at a certain rate um, when doing their first lighter colors, but then they move into the darker tone, and they're moving it in quite, you know, at the same rate, and things are just getting really dark. So you, always, you know, you kind of hold things up at a distance periodically and take a look at it, okay? Rather than just kind of focusing in certain areas where you're doing the application. And you can get a good feel of the overall gist of what the scene is um, becoming, um, kind of holding it out at arm's distance. Don't focus in on the, you know, the tiny portions and change the rate of your application up a little bit, okay? So... Kind of work in smaller areas a little bit longer. I mean, this doesn't take a long time. I mean, this is a large scene that I'm working in right here, but it's coming together fairly fast. Relatively speaking, you know, for the size. See this right down here in the cloud? I want that cloud to kind of stand out. So I'm not going to tone it out all the way. I put a little bit of color into it. 
but you can also come into it with a very dry version of this, like, you know, like that. Okay. I need to remember to use my uh, um, alcohol pens on this uh, this piece. Sometimes I forget to use my pens on these uh, on these video lessons. The alcohol pens can get into uh, some nicely detailed areas. Okay, this is um, called light blue. It's it's a pretty. It's more like a medium blue. All right, I need a new paper. To well, do I need a new paper towel? Let me. There's a ton of ink in this one here. Let me just be careful. I'll just try to use a light touch. Uh, my son's playing piano in the background there. <laughs> this gets a little bit loud. We'll have some background video music here. All right, look at that brightness coming in and that water down there. It's kind of turquoisey looking. Um, it, it's really not that color though, that kind of warm Caribbean blue look right there. It's because it looks a little bit warmer because we have that um, antique linen, which is a warm color underneath it. So it's turning this blue, which is more of a neutral blue. It's like a peacock blue or something. Um, into a much warmer looking hue, okay? So the colors underneath, even if you go over the top of them, um, are affecting what we see on the surface here. So antique linen, mostly covered up, but it's not a lost um, cause. It's, uh, it's influencing the overall appearance because all the colors that we're adding on top are transparent. Now, that looks a lot more like this one right here, doesn't it? So, I mean, we could use that. All right, let me, let me switch paper towels. Okay, I just want a half sheet like that, okay? Doesn't mean you're gonna waste a half sheet for that one thing. I, I just keep using different portions of this one for different colors as well. Okay, now this one's a much deeper, brighter um, looking uh, Caribbean blue, warm blue, okay? Because that's the color itself, you know, rather than some combination of it. Caribbean blue is a way of really uh, warming things up. I didn't use it for years because it wasn't in that original set of, um, of, uh, 40 colors that Marvy released in these Marvy Matchables. They no longer have the Matchables. Well, they do have the Matchables, but it's just not, uh, you have to buy a blank pad and add that um, color to it. Or you just get the ring, like I said, put a couple drops in something, wipe it up, and you're ready to go. All right. Okay, now I, I'm moving towards the same blue. But I stamped out my clouds, and now I'm I'm at that point right now. Okay, I'll just use this Caribbean blue portion like that, you know, and just add that to it. Okay, so what we're doing is you're adding some combination of Caribbean blue to um, uh, the next blue, which is in Marby. This navy blue is just called blue. Okay, I might have to pause this video. I don't know if my son's playing that or if he, what? Maybe he recorded himself. 
It's getting loud here. It's the uh, Maple Leaf Rag for anyone that doesn't know that song. I never tell him, hey, don't uh, play the piano um, because I'm making a video. You know, if any of you ever have kids and you want them to practice stuff, you know, it's, you know, you'll take it, you know, anytime they're doing it on their own rather than uh, playing Minecraft or video games or something like that, you know. Okay, there we go. All right, so anyways, this is that same blue, so that blue is starting to create a little bit of unity between these um, different cloud impressions, right? By using that same blue that you stamped out those objects in, okay? So I, I also stamped out my objects in black, okay? You know, all these. So that black, when I use black in here, that all that's also going to have this um, containment and continuity type of... Uh, effect on things, okay? So I always say, whatever, if, you know, colors you stamp your objects in, it's not a bad idea to add that same type of color somewhere else within the piece to bring everything together, okay? All right, so it doesn't have to be a straight black, though. It could be, you know, just a version of it, a much drier version of it. You, could, you know, a dry version of black is kind of gray, right? So in using things like this, too, you can get a lot of mileage out of your inks, okay? It means you can use them in their pure form as if you've stamped an impression out in them. But if you're just going for using them for tone, you can get straight black if you add a lot of it to it. But you can also add lighter versions, lighter, lightest, okay? You can even go for something like that tone right there. That's, you know, a certain gray. There's a gray. And there's a gray right here. This gray is like 5%. This one's like a 50%. Okay? So you can get a lot of mileage out of all your inks, you know. So a lot of times, you know, I won't, you know, if if it's, if I'm not buying like everything, if, you know, if money is no object, then I'm getting them all. But for something like this, um, if some color is roughly the same in terms of um, intensity, then I will usually opt to not get it because I know I can get that version of something just by using less of it. Okay. So when I, uh, in other words, so if I'm get like this green right here, I got this because this looks like more of an aged green, and it's not as if I just used a lighter version of this Marvy green, this real super bright green right here, you know. I'm not going to get that color, so I'll try to um, utilize um, existing colors to achieve a much lighter version of it. But if lighter versions, you know, are something that you'll never get um, to come close to a different version of that color altogether, that's when I get that type of thing. That, uh, Makes sense. You know, this is supposed to be a waterfall video, but I'm, here I'm talking about inks the whole time. But, I don't know, those are all the types of factors that come into uh, mind when using this type of um, kind of methodology here. Bottom line, you know, maximize your, your use of media and uh, you can get a lot of uh, different things from your existing media just by how you use it, okay? Most people have pads, so they're used to using those, of course, to, you know, get certain impressions out of it, but um, you can really play around with them and get different looks from the existing media and not just by changing your media or adding to it. It's just, you know, comes down to the handling of uh, all that existing media. Okay, so anyways, this is the black. You can see where that's really kind of toning in. 
You can see how it's blending in that imagery with the surrounding area. See that down here? See these areas in here? There's shadows in the designs themselves. So when I get into black, I'm usually kind of emphasizing those shadows or reiterating the shadows with some additional ink. Okay? And I'm not going with straight black here. This is like a, you know, it's a really light shade of gray because it's just so dry on my applicator. And that's where you have a lot of control over it. It's not as if I'm going with a super wet, you know, paintbrush or something like that. I'm just going slathering it right in there. And this way too, I'm not really surprised at any given time. It takes me a while to tap on that ink before it really even starts to show up, okay? So it's not as if I'm going to go like that and say, oh my god, I lost my light. I mean, I have to tap in there like a hundred times, you know, for me to lose that lighter area, okay? And that way, there, you know, there's a lot of control over it. There's not any kind of, uh, kind of undesirable marks that were unpredictable, you know? I mean, it, it develops slowly. So, you know what I mean? But when I say it develops slowly, I'm, you know, we're talking about you know, a couple seconds here. It's not as if that took forever, you know, but it took, you know, maybe 20 taps. 20 taps could be, you know, a few seconds. You know, it could be one minute for this whole piece right here, in theory. Just don't try to do it in, you know, five seconds or something like that. And you know, don't get impatient. You know, we're not talking a long time. Okay, but anyways, coming together... There's a lot of monotony in here, so I plan on going for a little bit of a change in hue, and I'm thinking, you know, this peeled paint would be fantastic. I want to add a little bit of a texturing onto some rocks, I think. You know, like lichen and whatnot. Um, just variation, okay? Details. See this thing about the vignette, about making kind of some areas a little bit darker around the perimeter? Not if it's on the waterfall, but, um, you know, in the kind of the rock portions. Corners right here, maybe. The corners are the areas where I've added a lot of tone are starting to get pretty wet, so um, it really allows me to spread the ink that I'm applying really smoothly, too, because it is so kind of saturated with ink already on the surrounding area. Okay, now, what I was saying here, too, like, I made that area a little bit darker because it was so wet, I, I didn't predict that. But I just made that rock just dark then, you know. And I'll try to make the area around it a little bit darker so that rock doesn't seem so dark by contrast, okay? Uh, so, I mean, it happens to me, too. It, happen it happens to me all the time. I just kind of compensate for it a little bit, okay? I'm talking about um, kind of unpredictable things, but it's not nothing extreme, though. I didn't wipe out all of my light within this space right here. But certain areas might get a little bit um, darker than I you know, kind of anticipated. And it was because there, you know, it was, uh, you know, the ink spread um, faster than uh, what I uh, intended because it wasn't um, getting absorbed into the paper as fast, okay?
is looking a little bit too bright of a blue, so I'll just dampen it a little bit with a little bit of black, and it makes it a little bit gray and kind of mutes it a touch. But I think that is about right right there. Okay, so let me go in. I was talking about using um, some uh, peel paint or something like that to change the uh, spirit of some of these rocks. Let me switch towels here. Okay, so let's try a little bit more warmth in some of these areas. Let's try some of this walnut stain. And I'm thinking about, you know, some of these foreground rocks. I figured the foreground rocks would have a little bit more variation. Eh, I don't know if I like the walnut stain in there. Eh, maybe not. If you don't like something, switch it. Let's try the peel paint. I have a feeling I'll like the peel paint, though. It, it'll put a little bit of a kind of moss on some of these um, rocks on the surface here. Okay, now remember, I'm just trying to tint this a little bit. And, uh, you know, you don't want to uh, just eradicate all of your... Um, you know, your oscillation of light by coloring in this area now. See this right here? I'm kind of coming into it like that. I'm not completely toning in these rocks so that there's still some variation in here. Yeah, let's add a little green maybe on this one as well. It's not as, you know, not as dark application of green. It's just kind of tinting some of these areas I like that right there. Kind of warms it up a little bit. What we're doing is we're also adding in um, kind of an element of uh, um, warmth within an otherwise very cool composition, uh, temperature-wise. Okay, something like that. Here it gets a little bit more intense. Here it's more muted. Kind of looking here. The more intense is usually the things that are closer to us. I don't know. I am. I'm. I'm trying to flatten out the field a little bit, but um, I don't know. I, I am going for some depth. I find. I, I. I don't know. I probably can't help it. Okay. So, I think that looks good for my colors right now. Let me clear out space here again. Okay. All right. So, we have our alcohol pens. Great pens to utilize on dye-based inks because alcohol and water don't mix. It's a little bit too light there. Uh, or dark. Um, let's let's go for some. Here's some blues, browns, gray here. This one's shuttle art. These ones are Marvy. Uh, let's go for some of this blue one right here. Let's go in and color in some of these rocks. I can hit them in the shadows a little bit more, or I can get Put a streak down of some color. That's a little bit too streaky. I'll just blend that in a little bit with some additional tone. This is a much lighter blue. It's, it's practically just a like a cool blending, cool temperature blending pen. So again, I'm not just trying to color in that whole thing. I want to have the some of the retain some of the the white of the paper. Okay some of these areas where they really stand out. When you go into something really light, it's very easy. Sometimes it's almost so invisible that you can't see it. Yeah, but it is a tiny tinge of this color. It's probably like 5% blue or something like that. You know, in terms of light scale. Zero being, you know, white or whatever, and, you know, 100% black being, hundred, you know, or 100% being black, as dark as you can get. All right, that was that. This one's an olive, brownish gray, sorry. So I can go into some of these rocks and render them a little bit more in the shadows. You can go over a gray or something like that. Here's a gray. This one's a blue gray. See, in some of these areas on the rocks that are darker, 
You can just go in and reiterate it a little bit more. Okay, that's a little bit too brownish for me. So what you do is you can blend it together with some other gray. So you can blend all these things together just like, you know, kind of they're intended um, on the glossy cardstock to, um, you can manipulate um, the tones that you've already laid down because they go back into solution. You can just kind of blend them away. You can use your blender pen too. Usually I just use another color out of my color scheme, but just a lighter version of it. You know, like that blue one that I was using. All right, so in here, I'm looking for shadows and I'm just going in and reiterating those shadow areas so I can get right next to that water without toning my water out or accidentally coloring it. I'm not even worried about kind of getting it perfect because I can just blend it in too, okay? I'm just kind of like adding, you know, some of that ink right there that I can spread out with, um, you know, a lighter tone or, and again, my, or a blending, um, blending pen. But all this little types of, you know, touches like this makes all of my objects seem a little bit more three-dimensional and shading, you know, you put a little bit more shade they're at the uh, the base of your rocks that they look like they're you know top lit okay let's see even this like distant waterfall in here i'm going in and adding some tone around it and that'll make it stand out a touch more i didn't i didn't lighten that up but i made the area around them darker so by contrast it stands out a little bit more This one's a Marvy pale blue. All right, um, I think that looks about right. There's so much <laughs> surface area in this scene. Uh, it's hard to remember where I applied all that, but all those darker alcohol marks to blend in, but. Okay, so far so good. All right, now here's where the fun begins. For me, not that that wasn't fun, but I really love adding in my little special effects types of uh, marks into pieces. Pigment ink, paint, white paint pens, white gel pens, um, Dr. Martin's Bleed Proof White. This type of stuff is really fun to uh, do. Special effects, or embellishments, you might say. Okay, so got it just a wadded up very used um, cotton ball you can use a new one but I find that I don't know after you use it a few times it gets better and better I mean at some point in time it gets just too clogged up with a uh, ink and I'll switch out but um, I like to have it where it's a little bit more smashed down where it's a little bit denser okay sometimes it start to get like these folds in here get a little bit too condensed but um, and it starts showing in my applications like that. But uh, until then, 
This works really good. All right, start applying where light meets dark. Okay. All right, let me see. See how that mist is coming off that waterfall like so? And I'll try to taper it the farther it gets away from the falling water. I use less taps, okay, so I don't want it just harsh, you know, white there. In fact, it's a little bit too dark, so I'll kind of tap off some of it with my finger like this sometimes, you know, and it removes ink. But see this right here? Oh, it's really sharp. Let's put a little bit of a, you know, ink into this area like that. See where that creates that kind of glowing transitioning churning water down there. See right there? Does that look, from a textural standpoint, much richer? Okay, you have something very defined. I mean, these clouds and this kind of billowing um, type of uh, churning water down here. What I can do is I can kind of come into that and add additional tone to that. So the uh, That mist down here created at the base of the waterfall looks a little bit more dimensional now. You know, you have that cloud down there that kind of represents that. But um, if you put this over the top of it in certain areas, you don't have to do it over all of it, okay? Put it over like the top that portion of it, you know, that cloud. And it just looks so much more deep in terms of uh, the dimensional space. We have a variety of. Um, values within this space. This makes everything lighter, okay? So like right in here, where it gets a little bit darker, let's add a little bit of light back into it. Where it gets too dark, this, you know, I don't add too much of this. But um, from a textual standpoint, it can really make things interesting. Look at this right here. Okay, see that? And see where I've kind of created this little layer of clouds at the base of this by not coloring in the bottom portion of, or drawing off the bottom portion of this tall rock with fall stamp it created that little mist right here right well I'll add some more of this white pigment ink in here and that mist will kind of look like it's it's rising up higher like that So remember where light meets dark, and there was a little tiny bit of light down there, so I'm adding this into where it becomes darker. And I'll try to transition it. I'll add most of it in the lighter area, okay? All right, you have that cloud back there. Let's add some over the light area of it, okay? And I'll transition a little bit into the darker area. Now, too much right there. Let me try to smooth it out. It might be time for a new cotton ball. I had a bunch of other ones but they were those acrylic types. I need to get the true cotton. It just, true cotton just works better. It's, it's denser um, and accepts the media better. All right, but see how soft that cloud looks now? So from a textural standpoint, this, I really love the look of this layer of pigment ink in here. Look at that transition right there. So we have something from diffused to sharp up here, light to dark. So sharp to um, dull, texturally, light to dark, value-wise, okay? So it's it, this type of thing can do a lot of things for things, uh, or a lot of things for a piece um, from a variation standpoint, okay? Remember I was talking about how you vary your lights and darks, you know, and it becomes a much richer surface. Well, we're doing that same type of thing here with texture and light at the same time with this. 
Okay, now this pigment ink always dries darker, at least on glossy paper, than it looks like when it's been freshly applied. So you have to kind of keep going over certain areas if you want it to, you know, achieve a certain type of, or retain a certain lightness that it looks like when you first apply it. Because once it starts setting up and drying, it looks darker. So just keep adding more layers to it and kind of build up that um, ink. All right, but see, I've done it in the background here now. Done it in the mid-ground. Let's go, well, this is still mid-ground, I guess. <laughs> There's so many layers here. Okay, see this, where light meets dark. And see, kind of as I go over here, I'm using less pressure, so it's tapering it off into the darkness, okay? What, what this mist represents is moisture in the air, right? It's moisture in the air being illuminated by light hitting it. So if it's an area of darkness over here, you probably want to have light hitting it, so I wouldn't use you know, too much of it, or if any, of this pigment ink in those darker areas, because you're saying that there's no light in those areas because it's all in shadow. So if there's moisture over there, it wouldn't be illuminated. Sometimes I do things from just a strictly um, a textural standpoint as opposed to lighting too. Like this right over here. Um, right in here, everything is really crisp in here. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll come in here just to create a little bit of contrast between this rock and the background. See, so what I'll do is I'll come in here like this. Okay, so see that right there? Doesn't it pull this rock out closer to us from a visual standpoint? So, see, you know what I mean? It doesn't really, sometimes it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't want to tone out everything, you know. You want to control it, but that got, you know, that was pretty dark over there, but I just put that little thing over the top of it. And then, I don't know, it blends it all together and it creates a little bit of a depth as well. So this can really, you know, it's a formidable, um, I don't know, technique in terms of uh, remedying certain things, visually, interest-wise, etc., light and dark. All right, let's go into our foreground down here. See this rock right here? Okay, I mean, it looks fine like that, but let's put a little churning water next to it. Look at that. It's being, now that rock is kind of being enveloped by, you know, kind of this glowing light like that. And so let's do the same thing over here, where light meets dark. Okay, so I've retained the lightness of that falling water, and I'm going into this rock right here. Put it down in my cloud area down here in the water. That churning water. Okay, so this right here. Look at that nice glow. Let's see, I'll taper it. Just use lighter taps as it moves into my darker area. Try to put more at the base of the waterfall. And we can put some fog along that stream right there. Okay. Okay. Let's come down here on this one. This one's going to be a lot of fun here because there's plenty of dark right next to the light. See that right there?
want to create a <laughs> this uh, environment here, here where it looks like if we were standing there, we would be kind of covered in, uh, in mist and seen you know, that suspended uh, moisture in the air being churned up by all these falls. Maybe there was record record uh, rainfall this uh, this season, so all all the falls are kind of going crazy, going off. Creating a little separation between this one and this one. Or a little more separation. I'm trying to vary my uh, degree of uh, pigment ink application. I'm kind of adding like a punch of it here and there. Like I said, it, it always dries darker than what um, I want initially, so I'm kind of adding a little bit more here and there. I want to vary this, just like I vary my shadows in terms of how much darkness is, is there. I'll, I like to do the same thing with my lightness and uh, lighter areas. Okay, I think that is about right. Sometimes if I don't achieve kind of the level of lightness in certain areas with uh, regular pigment ink, you can go to a brilliance. Uh, brilliance is a faster drying, kind of a little bit more opaque white, but it is very fast drying. And I would only do it over the top of this one in certain, you know, areas because once you lay it down, it cannot be manipulated as far as, you know, I've experienced. So let's say if I wanted an area to be a little bit lighter, then I would add it. Like in that little area, I wouldn't add it in the transition areas where it's like really faint. Okay, let's see. Um... 
Dr. Martin's bleed proof white. It's an opaque white watercolor paint. Okay, and I'm going to be applying it with a used toothbrush here. It's all flayed like there. Not flayed, but uh, what is it? Splayed? I can't even think of the word. But this is really hard right now. I need to go and wash it off. And then we'll be ready to go for some splatter painting. Okay, so it's a good thing I did that. My uh, microphone on my camera here was just about out of uh, juice, so I had to switch the battery. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm reconstituting this paint here. If you don't use it for a while, it even dries up to like a cake, you know, like those watercolor cakes. And you just add some water to it, get it the right consistency. I always say somewhere along the lines of like a kind of like a maple syrup or something like that. Nothing too thick, nothing too thin. Plenty of leeway though. It's not like it's some, you know, perfect formula or anything like that. Just enough to where, you know, if you put it on a toothbrush, you think it'll spray, okay? The thinner you make it, kind of the I find that the, the thinner, smaller the dot pattern um, it is, you know, just because it is so thin. So I like it slightly thicker because if possible, I like to go, when I do this, I, I like a little bit of variation in the dot pattern, you know, some thin, some thick. I don't have a lot of control over it though. Um, you know, especially if I don't do it for a while. So if I do it every day, I have a lot more control, but what now? I barely ever do that. Okay, so anyways, I'm going to be adding this at the base of these waterfalls, especially these ones down here, maybe. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Okay, let me see. I found that if I hold this up like this, I think you can see it easier. Normally, I don't do this. I would just, you know, do it down here, but then my hand is covering it, so let's see. It's hard to know which way this is going to. Sometimes I go like here and it goes right here and sometimes I go like this and it's winding up over there. Okay, adjusting my angle of my brush a little bit. Yeah, you see that right there? Let's spray in here. Some of it went all the way up here. Let me get this one right here. like that. Okay, let's go up here. I'm not going like this, you know, across the whole thing. I'm just kind of releasing a couple little hairs at one time. This is kind of giving that real crisp light on dark. Or, I don't know, not light on dark, but, uh, well, I guess it's light on darker because these are pure white dots. But um, it's giving um, a crisp application of light on dark, whereas the, uh, you know, the, the pigment ink was a complete, the white pigment ink was a complete um, soft application of light on the dark. It's really soft. This is a crisp little, you know, textural um, difference here. I won't use any in the background. That's just too far away. You're not going to see like splashes, but so there's little splashes like that. It, it gives the scene and that water um, a little bit of movement, wouldn't you say? Having that like that, it creates a little bit of a dynamic type of uh, feeling to it. 
Okay, there's my first one right there. Here's the second. Here, let me add a little bit more down here. My brush started co cooperating with me a little bit more. Okay, there we go. Churning water, huh? I had to put that down. I needed to get a couple more applications down there. I kind of want it, I want things a little bit kind of crazy in here, just because of the extreme kind of nature of this piece. Okay, I think that'll do it. That that white paint dries pretty fast. It's a uh, it's a little chalky. I think this is added right here. I'm going to toss this one. Um, it's a real chalky style of watercolor paint. I, I have a feeling that's why it's so opaque. Um, it just dries instantly and it covers. Okay. All right, so my final touches on here. I need to add in some additional um, elements in here. Yeah, let me just use this one again here. here. Okay, well, so we have a lot of pine trees in here, but I'm thinking more foliage and things, you know, on the perimeter. It wouldn't hurt to have some bold um, shapes within this space. Um, just for a change in... Um, distance and depth. Everything is somewhat flattened out right here, so we could use a little bit of a, I don't know, variation in here. So let me go grab some uh, stamps that we can use for that purpose. Okay, I have some different trees here. Um, leafless trees, which are, there's some in the designs themselves as well, so I can intersperse these here and there, I think. Create a little bit more um, depth within the piece. Um, hard to tell you know, where I want these placed or if I do want them placed somewhere. And I'm sure I do. So it's just a matter of finding that location within the composition. Okay, so maybe I'll work it from front to back. I don't know. There's different ways you can do it. Okay, so I'm going to use the Versafine Black. I just want, I need something nice and dark uh, within the space. <sighs> you know, anytime I say Versafine, I'm thinking, okay, that's the last step, you know, because I'm not going to be able to work on this piece, especially the size of piece, if I have Versafine objects stamped everywhere in here. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this white paint pen right now and... I'm going to, this is a Meowzen white paint pen. There's tons of them. If you just enter white paint pen on like Amazon or search engine, you'll come up with a you know, dozen of these types of uh, pens here. Um, okay, so let's go in and add a little bit of um, detailing on some of these rocks right here. I'll have them a little bit top lit. I'm not going to do this everywhere. I'll do this on some of these rocks just to add a little bit of lighting on top of them. The rock can't be too dark, otherwise you wouldn't have these highlights on top, but on some of these rocks that are fairly light, you know, the lighter it is, the more you can add of this. If it's white, this isn't going to show up at all, so, you, you know, the ideal part is rocks that have a little tint um, to them, and you can put a little bit of highlighting on top of it just to reiterate that idea of um, top lit, light direction, okay? Another place this looks really uh, good is on your falling water. Sometimes I like to just kind of create a trail um, coming down from those falls, like 
this. I'm kind of I'm using this paper towel right here because of that pigment ink that's down there. It's still a little sticky. That white pigment ink. Okay, so this is a really light shade of a uh, blue and uh, antique linen on here. So I can add quite a bit of this, but it has to be done in an area where I can see it too, for it to be effective. Now see, if you don't have something like the uh, Dr. Martin's Bleed Proof White, you can always use a white paint pen. You'd have to put a few little drops down there too. You probably wouldn't have as many of the splashing water types of effects. But you don't have to, okay? I mean, I don't, wasn't always using the Dr. Martin's. I usually use a white paint pen or a gel pen. Okay. Sometimes it's just a little highlight, a little dot on top of a rock somewhere where it's capturing that um, lighting. Okay, and maybe I'll use it a little bit more on the foreground um, elements because you would be able to see, you know, more details in them the closer they are to you. It's like as I'm, I'm doing this, you can see highlights like on my finger or something like that on my knuckles, right? See that little dot of light? I mean, top lit down here. So the things that are higher, <laughs> you know, are the ridges are on this pen right here. See this highlight right here? And that's darker on the sides. So as that would relate in here, I'm seeing I'm just putting these little highlights on the top sides of these, the ridges, okay? Top surfaces like that. And it just makes them look a little bit more three-dimensional. Well, I mean, it might look a little bit too extreme when you're looking up close like that. But, you know, when you pull back like that, it just kind of lends itself to, it adds up to a kind of a deeper visual space. You know, but if you look up closely, then it, you know, it might look, look, look a little bit too extreme, you know, in terms of a, a highlight or a embellishment, okay? And like I said, I'm putting it mostly where, um, you know, the rocks are already, you know, just a little bit... Dark. Like, I wouldn't want it in these shadows over here, okay? It would just stand out too much. But on these areas right here in the light, the waterfalls like this, Falling water, you can illuminate. If it's gone too dark, you can reclaim it with the white paint pen. Sometimes I get kind of smudges in areas where that I don't, you know, you don't want to smudge everywhere or anywhere. So I just, I just, if it's a light enough area, I just kind of reclaim those, you know, crisp areas with the uh, 
you know, something like this, or if I have a smudge, if I didn't like it, if it's really kind of an obtrusive looking mark, then I just go over with the uh, white pigment ink and just kind of dampen it down, you know, where it's, you know, something isn't quite as prominent. Um, you know, adding on that type of texture or to it, or like a fog in front of it where you can't see it as uh, distinctly. Okay, so things too, I mean, if I want more of these little dot patterns in a certain area where it's, you can't really get too specific with them, um, with uh, splatter pr uh, painting techniques. You can get as specific as you want with a, you know, a pen like this. So if you want a dot there, you can just add it. All right. It. That was a lot of, um, you know, we're dealing with falling water here. There's a ton of rocks, so there's a lot of opportunity to use something like that paint pen. Okay. Let's go with this versifying black. I'll go with a spruce tree large here. And let's add in some additional forms into the piece. Okay. I'll have this coming in from the bottom of the scene into the scene. Okay. This is adding foreground, but it also will kind of provide a little bit of framing element through the piece. Okay. Leafless pines large. Going into this quite a bit with this one. You still have an inch of it hanging off the bottom, but kind of when you run certain objects sometimes through various layers, it um, kind of give things a little bit of depth um, and sew up these um, different regions. like running a needle and thread through multiple layers of depth to kind of sew them together. Okay. All right, another impression of it down here. Okay, to go, go for a little bit of continuity in the piece, as far as the distance goes, let's use a smaller version of this one as well. Okay, and I can put that one up maybe in here. I was thinking that would be a good candidate. Or maybe I'll go for a smaller version of it. Yeah, I think the smaller. I never know until I get there, you know, which one I want to go with. And in one thing, it might change your plans for another element somewhere else. So stay nice and flexible and let your piece tell you kind of what you, you know, the ideal thing to do. Masking that part off, going for the small leafless pine. Okay, so it kind of creates that nice depth there. Uh, 
Okay, so <laughs> here we go. See that right there? Doesn't it help it a little bit? Um, hmm. I wouldn't mind another tree in here, I think. I don't want to go... For, I think that's enough for the, the leafless trees, that trio of them right there. Let's see. Let me grab um, another couple pine trees, and let's place them in here. I don't know if I'll go with... Well, maybe the Versavine, I'm not sure. I'll figure it out. Okay, let's go for this tree right here. I'm not sure I could use... I could use all three, but I think I'm just going to use this one right here. It's just one tree off of the pines and rocks small. I was going to use my tree duo, but uh, this one is just right there, so I'm just using that tree. And hopefully, let me let me make sure that this doesn't have some residual ink on it from the previous whenever I used it last. Yeah, okay, not bad. All right, so. That right there. That's a little lonely. Let's go for another one right next to it. Another impression of it. Okay. We'll make it a little bit lower. Okay. Kind of creates a nice transition from large, you know, like this. It also breaks up this space a little bit, too. Okay, let's go for another one. That's working out pretty good. Uh, let, me, let me move into the... I'll go into two of them right here, okay? So it's inked up. Maybe, I don't know, I'm kind of, I feel like adding one right there, but it, there's so much pigment ink right there, and splashing, um, Dr. Martin's Bleak Proof White there. I don't think I'm going to get a good impression right there, so maybe I'll just leave it like that. Uh, okay, let me go for one more impression of this. I like these shapes right here, but I want to give a little bit more of a continuity in terms of depth, so we use these for the background right there, but now I'll just ink up this, and I'll throw them right down here in the foreground as well. You see all kinds of different pine trees uh, next to each other in the forest all the time. You know, redwoods, ponderosas, whatever. So this one's a little bit of a different type right here. But that gives this foreground something in common with that area right in there. Okay. And... I was thinking about adding this right in here, this overhanging tree, like we're standing underneath some tree looking into the scene. But maybe I won't. <laughs> I don't know. I, let's stick with the pines right there, I think. Um, I don't know. That... That might look pretty good. Okay, let me let me let me revisit that idea. Hmm. 
I think I do want some containment here. It's just too open on the top. Or I can put something up there. Maybe that's what I'll do. Okay, so let's take this me out. So I think I know what to do in there. I need some containment, or maybe this will provide kind of a focal point. Okay. Thinking about it like a North Star type of thing. All right, boy. Okay, let's see. Let's put it right there. Clean it off my tip here. Let's put it about right here. What I do is I do a little dot right here. I had all these little rub-ons, you know, these those transfers <laughs> of this type of star, but I've kind of run out of the size that I used to use all the time. Because we don't sell those anymore. Okay. So I'm going down like that. Each time I do my little downstroke, so what I do is I position this in a manner, which I can do that downstroke easy. If I mess up on a downstroke, all I need to do is wipe that off and it'll come right off. Okay, let me see if I can do an upstroke. <laughs> Okay, like that. And I'll make these um, secondary ones shorter, okay? Like this. I'm making the, uh, the vertical ones a little bit more prominent because this is a vertical format right here, so I'm making the star. I'm following suit with the star. Ooh, that's too far. Let's wipe some of that off like that. Okay, so anyway. It's kind of weird that little star up there has become... I think it's become the focal point of the scene. Like that. <laughs> you know, all this is going on, but my eye kind of goes right to that star in many ways. Okay, so let's just finish off that star. Um, what we do is we grab a, a little Q-tip like this. Time for a new Q-tips, I think. And go for our white pigment ink. Q-tips are a great um, applicator, too, to get in real specific areas. And you just kind of blot this off to where it's not like a big glob of paint, you know, ink on the tip right here. And we're just going to lightly tap this into it. One tap, hopefully, you can't see anything. But with multiple taps, you're applying a very light, thin application of this. Maybe it takes 20 taps to get what I want. What does that mean? It means control over your application amount. And that's what I want. I don't want to have to redo that star you know, by wiping it out off the page and then restarting again. So this and it comes into focus really slowly like that. See, you have that nice glow. And what is that? I don't know. It's like 30 taps or something like that. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Let me add a little bit of this to my cloud down here, too. 
think that cloud can use a little bit more white ink to kind of create a frosty, soft, glowing object, you know, sky object. Little refinements here and there. Oops, look at this, I'm touching that VersaFine black and it's getting on my uh, arm here. I need to be careful about it. It's all down in this area, so I can't, you know, I need to be careful with those areas. Okay, so there's some areas in here that I wanted a little bit lighter, but doing it with the uh, cotton ball wasn't getting there. I, I, this is, I can put a thicker slathering if I want it, you know, in some areas. Okay, I'm doing a lot more of this than I kind of was anticipating, but I think it looks really good. And plus, um, like I said, that, that pigment ink dried much darker in certain areas. Um, so this is an area to kind of just add a little punch of additional white uh, in wherever you want it to go. Because this is, I can add it, in some areas I want it to add very, a very thin amount, but in some areas, you know, where I want it really light, I can add a thicker amount in a very specific targeted area with a, you know, a smaller applicator than, you know, a cotton ball.
Okay. Boy, that was a lot more than I thought, but um, I think it needed it in some of these areas here. Um, yeah. It's hard to see what I was doing, but... Um, Like in just in some areas down here, I've just oscillated that you know the degree of opacity translucency, yeah, something like that. Yeah, let's see. It's, <laughs> it's time for some new applicators. Okay, so it seems like I just kind of transition some of these. Some of these areas are a little bit too sharp. So you just kind of diffuse it a little bit like that. Okay. So a lot of textural changes happening throughout the piece. Okay. So we have a lot of light, dark, light, dark. So it goes dark, light, you know, whatever, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. I mean, in any direction that you move, you can move from left to right, top to bottom, diagonal. You're going to be running into these dark light, dark light, you know, dark light, and so on and so forth. There's no just straight area of light. I guess this goes lighter across here. That gets broken up a little bit right here, though, right? So even this band of lightness, you know, it gets broken up by these other shapes of dark light. I mean, light, dark, light, dark. Okay, so that's that oscillation there. But you also have this oscillation of... Um, soft and sharp. So this is a sharp right here, soft right down here, right? And even within those soft spaces, like right in here, we have those elements, little sharp points of the uh, the Dr. Martin's, you know, those little white dots, okay? So there's all kinds of textural changes that are happening in here, contrasting um, values, contrasting textures, um, yeah, a little bit of contrasting shapes, okay, so you have those clouds that are soft within those spaces right here, within the harder rock. But by and large, you just, you know, you're just going for variation, so just don't treat everything exactly the same. And even on certain objects, you can change them. You know, you can have them darker on one side and lighter on the top, you know. So just treat things a little bit differently. Um, as you work across your page. Okay, so don't just treat whole things as all of the same because nothing's the same like that. This bottle right here, you know, is darker on the side, or this cap right here is all the same color, but it's darker on one side, top lit. Stamps are all the same, you know, it's basically the same color of wood, but you know, when you light it like this, it's darker on this side, lighter on the top. But I put it like this, this side's you know, lighter on the top and darker on the side. So it's just kind of seeing, imagining objects in a little bit of a three dimensions, okay? Textures and things like that as different things. And just vary it. The biggest thing is, I mean, it might sound complicated, but watch my um, uh, Stamscape University um, video on um, coloring and how we just do grayscale coloring. And you'll see where you can really handle a lot of this just in value using gray ink, okay? And to get things established um, with your pieces that way. And it can be a really easy process. And it's easy to see, especially if you're just using grayscale. This is not too many colors in this one. It's just, you know, it's most of your blue tones and also some gray. But for the most part, it's a pretty simple. Um, it's just a very extensive one, um, composition and color scheme, just because of the size of this right here. So, anyway, uh, yeah, this is the most extreme waterfall scene I've ever done. What do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine waterfalls all in one piece. So, can we cram more into it? No, eh, not too many more, unless you change the scale of a your scene, but um, really fun stuff to do. And I really love adding um, kind of all these uh, textural changes going throughout the piece and having all these multiple waterfalls really gave me an excuse to do so. Okay, so anyways, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning into the channel. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you have any questions, drop us a note in the comments section.